second is just share a feature, not this. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Vishweshwaraya Industrial and Technological Museum, Bangalore, it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome you all to today's very special program on Teacher's Day, My Teacher, My Mentor, Reminiscence by Eminent Scientists. On this occasion, we have four prominent scientists from all across India sharing their views regarding their mentors, regarding the teachers that have inspired them to become what they are today. And in this, so we are, we are very happy to have all the four prominent scientists here. Thank you very much, madam, for uh, accepting our invitation and being here and sharing your valuable views with us. And to, before we begin, uh, you know, this session in terms of the, uh, in terms of the talk by the scientists, I would like to, give some basic instructions about this program kindly mute your audio and video throughout this program and please just concentrate on uh, the talk and if you have any questions please type in the chat box and if time permits our speakers will definitely get back to you and answer those questions 
So with this, I invite our director, Shrimati K. A. Sadhana, to present the welcome address. Sadhana, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jyoti. Good morning and a warm welcome to all who have joined us today. Happy Teachers Day to all the teachers here. Every year, September 5th is celebrated as Teachers Day to mark the birthday of the country's former president, Dr. S. Radhakrishnan, highly respected teacher, philosopher, and prolific statesman who was born on this day in 1888. When Dr. Radhakrishnan took the office of the second president of India in 1962, his students approached him to seek permission to celebrate September 5th as a special day. Dr. Radhakrishnan instead made a request of them to observe September 5th as Teacher's Day to recognize the contribution of teachers to the society. So that's how Teacher's Day, we started celebrating Teacher's Day as September 5th. In this pandemic era, teachers have shown, as they have done so often, great leadership and innovation in ensuring that learning never stops that no learner is left behind. Around the world, they have worked individually and collectively to find solutions and create learning environments for their students to allow education to continue. On this occasion, Vishweshwe Industrial and Technological Museum is hosting the session on My Teacher, My Mentor, Reminiscence by Eminent Scientists. We have with us four eminent women scientists who will take us on a trip down their memory lane and share reminiscence of their favorite teachers who contributed enormously to shape their inclination towards science. We have with us Professor Rogni Kodbol, Professor at the Center of High Energy Physics at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, who's a good friend of the museum. She has given talks on various occasions at the museum. On behalf of Vishwesha Museum, it's my privilege to welcome to welcome you for this program, Professor Godbole. We are very happy to have you back on this virtual stage, not the real stage. I would also like to welcome Professor Paramjit Kurana, Professor at the Department of Plant Molecular Biology from Delhi University. A warm welcome to you, Professor Paramjit Kurana. We have with us Dr. Nivedita Gupta, a senior scientist at the Indian Council of Medical Research. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Nivedita. Then we have with this Professor Pradwal Shastri, an astrophysicist and a retired professor at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. Professor Pradwal Shastri is also a close friend of the museum. She has visited the museum on various occasions and given talks. A warm welcome to you, Professor Shastri, and we are happy to have you back with us. I would like to thank all of you for having accepted our invitation and taking time off your Sunday morning for joining us for this session. In spite of being a Sunday, we are seeing a lot of uh, participants who have joined us for this program. I welcome all the teachers, students, friends, and my colleagues at the museum who have joined us for this session. Welcome one and all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Padam, for the welcome address. And uh, with this, we'll have our first speaker for this program, Professor Rohini Godbole, who is a scientist at Center for High Energy Physics of IISC Bangalore. Uh, I will just give a brief about Madam's profile. Professor Rohini Godbole is a particle physicist best known for her work at CERN, European Organization for Nuclear Research. Her work on high energy photons could form the basis for the next generation of particle colliders used to study the fabric and composition of the universe. She works on the aspects of standard model of particle physics, which describes the properties and behaviors of elementary particles of the universe. She works on the aspects of the standard model of particle physics which describes the properties and behavior of elementary particles of the universe. Apart from her work in academics, Professor Godbole is also a much sought after communicator of science, often delivering talks to young students, scholars, and scientists on everything physics. 
She is an avid supporter of women pursuing careers in science and technology, and along with Rama Ramaswamy, edited the book Leelawati's Daughters, a collection of biographical essays on women scientists from India. She is today a part of International Detector Advisory Group for the International Linear Collider at CERN, which monitors the design and working of ILC detector. She is also the chair Professor Roh Rohini Godbole, Madam, we welcome you once again to this program. And now the stage is yours. So kindly share your reminiscence with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me uh, begin by wishing all the teachers in the audience um, a very, very happy Teachers' Day. I'm just trying to see how to share my files. Uh, because somehow earlier it could be done. Uh, let me see. Yeah, can people see my first slides? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. You can, can see, see it. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you very much. So, indeed, it's a great pleasure. And actually, I would like to thank the VITM for asking me to talk about my teachers and my mentors because this gave me an excellent uh, you know, occasion to look back. And that's why I have called this remembering the teachers and mentors in a life of science. You know, we are celebrating today the teacher's day and these conveners asked me to talk about the teachers and mentors who influenced my journey on the path of an academic life. Now, when I look back, and because of this, I started thinking and I looked back at my life in academics and I realized uh, that there are three different stages where the teachers and the mentors have played a very important role in my life as a in my scientific career. And I think they play an important role in the life of a person in a scientific career. So what are those three in my mind? One is the school education. The second is the graduate education where one makes some hard choices about, you know, the academic career and life because these are intertwined somehow. Then the third one is early stages in a career in science when one is trying to stand on one's own two feet and create one's research niche. This comes right after PhD. And then, you know, for a few years, maybe you have to establish yourself as an independent scientist, not somebody working with somebody under somebody's guidance, but your own person. And in addition to all this, one's future journey in science also get influenced by watching senior colleagues whom one respects and how they conduct their academic life. I will try to use this opportunity to talk about people who I think have influenced in all these four different ways. First, it got me thinking about my school days. When on Teacher's Day, those days, and this is 1960, time from 1962 to 1968 when I was in high school. And there on Teacher's Day, we celebrated it by running the school. That is, each one of us play, role played one of the teachers. And I think we mostly just had fun by copying their specific styles of talking, specific way of teaching, not much, much else. But it was a lot of fun. But when I started thinking more seriously about how that life and those teachers impacted in my choice today of a life uh, in science where I find myself and also the way I conduct it, I found that there was a lot of impact. And some of the experiences that I had then may not have directly taught science, but certainly they did play a role in preparing one for an academic life. So let me try to share that with you. So there are four different experiences from school that I'm going to share. One is preparing for the state scholarship examination uh, in my seventh class. And <clears throat> in fact, my first steps in science followed from that uh, state scholarship examination. So I will spend a little more time on this than the others. 
But then I also used to participate in a large number of debating and elocution competitions and the positive impact of that in my life in science. Then the reading habits that were inculcated and nurtured by teachers specifically by taking a lot of pains. And last but not the least, an experience that I want to share with you about how I learned how one should treat students as equal members of the educational community. Then I will follow it up with experiences in college as well as in IIT. There I will talk about two mentors. One was a professor, he's, he's still there. Both of them are luckily, I think I've been very, very lucky that most of the mentors that I will talk to you today are still around there. And it's a great pleasure to hear from them once in a while on the occasion when I got my Padma Shri or the occasion when I got my French order, hearing from them, talking to them and getting their blessings all over again was an experience that I truly cherished. So one is my mathematics professor in my college, M. R. Railkar, and one is my theoretical physics professor in IIT, Professor S. H. Patel. And that was not enough. I needed and got, I was very lucky to get a lot of encouragement and support in my academic career in the early part thereof, as well as people who taught me by their example. And those are two people I would like to mention is Professor Abbas Rangwala, who was the head of the department in University of Bombay when I was a faculty member there, and Professor N. Mukunda, who has been my colleague at the Indian Institute of Science for a large number of years. But even much before that, he I knew him as a, a shining member of the Indian theoretical physics community. So let me try to go one by one. So let me begin at my school experiences. Uh, I went to a school called His Highness Chintaman Rao Patwadhan High School. This school by itself is a pretty iconic school. The school today has finished 137 years. It was founded in 1884. And in fact, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was the first English school. So it used to be called Female English School for Girls. And I have taken a picture, like this must be 1965, 1964, some, or maybe 70, 60, uh, I think 64, 65. And you can see this is a picture of some of the teachers who used to teach us. And you can see here, for example, these women wearing the traditional nine yard saris. And here was the headmistress who had newly joined them. And there was a big to do and hoopla about it because she used to wear a five yard sari. I'm just trying to tell you this to give you an idea of the period of the time that one is thinking about. And here I have circled pictures of four, fifth, five of my teachers. Uh, this is the headmistress about whom I would talk much later. This is a, whom, whom I used to call my friend teacher or teacher friend. And I will talk about her also later. In this slide, I wanted to mention and talk about these two teachers. One is, uh, her name was Shakuntala Gundi, and other was uh, Nitsure Bai, as we used to call them. These were, I, I went to a Marathi medium school, so I didn't have Nitsure ma'am, but I had a Nitsure Bai. So these two teachers, science, she was uh, teaching us science, and Nitsure uh, Bai used to teach us uh, mathematics. Then there is, uh, you know, what happened was, ours was a complete girls' school, all girls' school. And as I said, with this glorious old tradition, but with the old tradition also come, came very old practices. So it, till the seventh grade, our school used to teach us only home science. And there were no classes, no courses in general science. And in the seventh grade, there used to be a state scholarship examination, for which maybe you know, a few thousands, maybe I don't even know, 10 thousands maybe would apply. And the, Maybe there were 10 scholarships that would be given by the state government. And they were very, you know, meager scholarships. I mean, you would laugh. Some of the students in the audience would laugh. It used to be four rupees per month. But then the school fees was five rupees per month. So the scholarship was more of an honor than actual financial help. And somehow nobody from my school ever got, got it. 
simply because there was a paper in general science and none of the students had ever learned it. So somehow in the year I was to appear, this was in the seventh grade and this must be 64 or 65. And uh, I went to my teachers like Gundi Bai, Nupsira Bai, and one more Sohoni Bai, who used to teach me mathematics. And these three teachers and some more of uh, also actually took classes on the weekends, Saturdays, Sundays, and these women, of course, they were full fledged uh, housewives. And I could see it must have now that I can imagine it must have been easy week after week, every Saturday for four hours to sit with us, me and maybe a few more friends. And I remember that they helped us work with, they had worked with us to prepare for the state scholarship examination. And indeed, as luck would have it, I got it. And that was the first year that student from my class, from our school, got the state scholarship examination. And at that time, my uh, mathematics teacher, uh, Mrs. Sohoni, I'm showing you a picture of uh, my science teacher and math teacher, Mr. and Mrs. Sohoni. So Sohoni Bai, as I, call, we, I used to call her, she suggested to me that uh, her husband, Bhau Sohoni, as we used to call them uh, affectionately, and uh, she said he teaches, he is a science teacher, and I think you should come home and learn science from him because I want to show you that not only that we had only uh, uh, science for the last three years, and that science used to be taught by uh, uh, the only, I think there were only two male teachers, three male teachers perhaps, maybe he was the registrar, I don't remember, these two male teachers, and this was. Uh, uh, a teacher, a science teacher who used to teach us, but somehow she felt that I needed a broader uh, uh, exposition and she asked me to come home and start talking to Sohoni's sir or Sohoni, Bhau, so, Bhau, as we used to call him and Bhau in Marathi actually means brother. So he had that enormous affection for all of us and I can remember, till, I, I think some of the early lessons about what a teacher ought to be. I got from him and I got some very early lessons in science. I learned what it is to do science and what it is to study something, not do science, but study science, which was outside the textbooks. And I think he uh, got me introduced to uh, participating in science essay writings. Then as a result of that, I remember learning new things about nuclear power, nuclear uh, reactions, nuclear bombs. Then there used to be a Marathi magazine because I was in a Marathi medium school. I could not read much English at that time. He directed us to a, a magazine which used to be called Shruti Gnan. And I think all my friends who, even if they don't know Marathi, they would understand the meaning of this word because it's the same in Hindi or Sanskrit. And I learned a lot of things from such simple things at that time. So really he was responsible for my taking first steps in the path of science. And I, it's, it's really amazing that I can really pinpoint it to one person like this. But then, of course, uh, that was not all that we learned in school. There was this another teacher whom I would like to remember today, and her name was Chandutai Sate. She, uh, okay, that as a, uh, one of the things was that she was single. She used to uh, bring up, she had brought up her uh, brother's uh, family. But she didn't have, in that sense, she didn't have her own children and she looked upon all of us as her own children. But she taught us something very important. She didn't teach us only the subjects, but she taught us about the, you know, how one should follow one's own star. And that was something. She taught us about integrity. I learned from her how to be true to myself. And to be honest, that had stayed me in very good state in my life as a scientist when I wanted to achieve something, I really had to ask myself, am I capable of doing this? And if others are saying I'm not capable, I should be true to myself, what I think, what I believe in. And I think she's the one who taught me, who inculcated that self-belief, that uh, integrity in me. And at that time, I even remember my younger sister could sing very well and that she could recognize in the class when she, my sister was asked to sing a poem. 
And at that time, she actually sent a message, asked my mother to come and see her and said, you know, you should give her a special instruction in music to this uh, daughter of yours. Her, she sings very, very well and she should develop it. Now, these were the kind of teachers that I think I was very, very lucky in having them. A second experience, as I told you, I was also wanted to talk to you about teachers who helped us, you know, to help me participate in my debating and elocution activities. And that was uh, Super Paranspe, as I would call her, or SP Paranspe, as it's written here in English. And she was the one we used to call her as my friend teacher. I have taken a picture here from, uh, I couldn't find a picture where I and her, we were sitting together. But many a time she has directed and helped me in preparing many a debating and elocution competitions. And we have had such photographs where we won some of the competitions and got shields and uh, medals. But I think more than that, she taught me to study, how to study a subject and then present it logically. Something that helps me today in my career as a scientist. Even more important than that, she also inculcated the habit of reading English literature in me. She was young. Her, young, young, her eldest daughter was about the same age as my youngest sister. So there was not very much of a, you know, that way uh, age gap. And I remember through her, I saw how is it that a woman who is very energetic and who is very committed to her career would try to balance life and uh, life at home, family and work. And I, I remember many a times going to her house to prepare for some talks or borrow some books. And I think we, I became really a part of that family. In fact, the family connection actually continued much further. She became even a family friend. And my mother, and this is my mother, who started teaching at the age of 43 in the same school from where I had uh, uh, graduated uh, say six or seven years before. And she and her, they became colleagues. And this, there is now a very big personal relationship between families. My youngest sister is actually a very good friend of the eldest daughter of uh, my teacher. So these kind of friend teachers who helped me develop my personality, I think I owe a lot to them also. Then there was yet another one. There was another uh, teacher called Malti Vase. And she was actually the second teacher, apart from Super Ranspe, who actually helped me and encourage uh, reading habits. And she used to ask us to help arrange books at her home in summer vacations. Little did we realize that it was just a ruse to get us to read those books. But I think again from her, I learned a lot about how one should be conducting one's academic life and the integrity that one should hold. My discussions about my school will really not be over unless I talk about the headmistress of our, of our school whom I showed you, and uh, she was our headmistress. And as I said, she joined the high school, perhaps the same year that I did, namely 1962, because 1958 to 50, uh, 62, I was in the primary school. She was the inspectress of girls' schools for the Maharashtra state before she joined the school. And her subjects were English and education. In one of the few years that she had been the headmistress, she actually gave a subject for the English essay competition for the students in 11th grade or maybe 10th grade. I don't remember whether I was in 10th or 11th. And the subject was reforms that may be made in my school. And she herself was a bit of a reform to the old school. Remember the photograph I showed you? So this was the, the uh, we used to have a school magazine. And I have, uh, and the essays which got prize would be published there. So here was uh, yours truly, Rohini M. Godbole. And I had written an essay called reforms that may be introduced in my school. The, I was, uh, I think I was pretty incorrigible as a young student and I made suggestions left, right and center. And one of the most important suggestions came from the experience I had had with learning science. So I said, our, I have just produced a few excerpts from that article. Our school has been teaching domestic science from the uh, fifth, uh, fifth stand, fourth standards, uh, fifth, fifth standard. It is correct that girls should know domestic science to make themselves good housewives. I accepted that. But however, my practical experience is that this was a great handicap for me in my high school scholarship examination. And then I went on to say that our knowledge in general science was uh, totally inadequate. 
So I said, I don't suggest that the domestic, domestic science should not be taught, but I suggest that the general science should be taught to enable us to compete better in the high school scholarships and SSC examination. Then I went on actually to suggest that many of my friends complain that they don't have rooms in the house to study. I am very lucky, but I feel for my friends. If they can study in our library, it will be a very good thing. Now, having written things like this, when she called me to her office, I was a bit worried, but she sat me down and she discussed all the suggestions one by one. And in fact, all the suggestions that I've told you on the earlier page and some more that I had made were actually implemented by my school. The school started studying general science along with somewhat reduced home science from the fifth grade itself. Science laboratories were renovated. They were, they were pitiful. And I think, you know, I don't blame them. They had not realized that this is something that the girls need to get ahead in. And the minute that was pointed out that we need to be able to competitive, be competitive, I think the school teachers took it completely in good stride and did everything that they could do to prepare us in science as well. And I remember at that time suggesting again in my arrogance that the school should start an English medium division. It's not a very good idea to study in mother tongue. Then again, she, she was education expert in fact. So she explained to me that there is a difference between acquiring competence in a foreign language for expanding the horizons of one's education and importance of education in the mother tongue in the early days. So what did, you know, I think I learned from her very important lessons about education and more importantly, how you treat students as equals beyond a certain stage. I think I was either in the 10th or 11th standard at that time and she treated me as an adult and at the same time clarified matters that I did not yet know much about. So I would forever be thankful to all these teachers that I'm telling you about who some of them say were directly responsible for setting me on the path of science. Some of them were in, di indirectly responsible, for, uh, directly responsible for setting me and teaching me values of an academic life. Then there is this one teacher and her name is Bapat. We used to call her Bapat Bai. And she actually, I still remember, I when I won the uh, state scholarship examination, I, I was 10 years old. You know, I, and I used to explain many things to students all the time. People would ask me questions. And she saw me in the... Uh, school races explaining some point about uh, mathematics class or physics class or whatever it was I don't remember so the another student asked me a question and I explained it to her but then she called me afterwards and she said I it was very nice that you teach your young uh, your other colleagues and students in the class but please make sure that you you are humble you should not be showing off and that's a quality it, that's a lesson I think I have remembered for all my life. So these are the people who helped me get into a life of science and get me into a life with integrity. When I left school, it was not clear to me what I would like to specialize in. I knew I wanted to do a PhD. I had joined Science Stream. I had also got the National Science Talent Scholarship, which is the counterpart of today's KVPY. And somehow in this period, I think I absorbed much more from my student friends in the NSTS summer schools than actually, uh, you know, from the college and the lectures. And they excited me about science quite a lot. But I should mention one very significant influence on me in this period, and that's Professor Emma Reilker. He, in those the two years that he taught me mathematics, he brought out the beauty that the subject, inherent beauty that the subject has. And actually, I almost decided to do PhD in mathematics. And this was more than teaching theorems, more than teaching one, you know, set theory, uh, which was the big thing at that time, and set theory was learned in colleges. But I understood from him the beauty that a theoretical subject can have. And from him, I learned or felt what it is to fill the pool, pool of science. So this was the first step for me, which sort of told me that this is what I want to do. And the two years in IIT Mumbai were extremely important for me from the point of view of fixing the direction of my future journey in science. And one of the most influential figure is my teacher, Professor S.H. Patil, or S.H.P., as I used to call him. We all used to call him. And I think he helped me to begin to see the beauty that theoretical physics has 
And that is where I decided and chose to do PhD in this subject. He truly cared for all of us and he loved teaching all of us whatever he knew and he understood many, you know, many concepts, subjects in theoretical physics extremely uh, thoroughly and he conveyed it to me. He had a wonderful tact about how to learn, how to teach you to learn something on your own. In fact, I still remember there was an exam. There used to be, you know, we were only 17 students and there was an exam and he had given a problem and where if you got the point, you would finish the problem in about 20 minutes. And if you didn't get the uh, main point, even the whole one and a half hour will not work for the exam. That was the only problem in the exam. And I remember I sort of finished it in 20, 15 minutes and I see all my 15 students, co-students sitting and scratching their heads. And I was very worried. And then he told me, if you have finished it so soon, you have done it correctly, go. He had this enormous ability of judging a student. And I think many, many of my classmates and generations that followed have benefited from him. He was actually awarded the Best Teachers Award by the Indian National Science Academy. And a very, very large number of his students from IIT Pawai are important part of India's theoretical physics community. And I don't think it's an accident. I would really like to play my tribute, pay my tribute to this great teacher on this teacher's day. This is SHP and some of his ex students who all of us had gathered together to pay tribute to him on his 65th birthday, telling him what we were doing. The other last, and now I'm coming closing stages, mentors in the early stages of research career. And uh, this is my in my Mumbai University. As I had told you already, beginnings are tough times in a scientist's career. And this is sometimes, you know, different. This is actually different from other professions where there is not much of an apprenticeship. I mean, you get your degree as an engineer and you start working as an engineer. But here you do research under somebody else's guidance. And it is these early years when, you know, you are asking questions. Am I cut out to do this? Can I think of my own problems which will be interesting enough, which will be solvable and which will be interesting for the rest of the community and which will contribute to the progress in the subject. Now, the senior colleagues who provide necessary moral support and mentorship play a very, very important role. One may not do science with them, but their advice and the help can be invaluable in the progress of the scientific life. And I would like to mention my senior colleague, Professor Abbas Rangwala at this time. Uh, in this context. He was too a great teacher and in fact a recipient of the INSA Best Teachers Award also. I seem to be associated with uh, great teachers. All my, I had the good fortune of being associated with these great teachers. He could have been my teacher but was not because I did my MSc in IIT Mumbai. But I count him among my teachers and mentors because he gave me enormous support in my efforts to continue research in frontline areas in not so easy circumstances. I, I still cannot remember his kindness in sharing his lecture notes that I joined in November and I was supposed to start teaching a course on mathematical methods. And this kind person actually gave me his lecture notes and said, you know, you need not follow it, but you can prepare your own lecture notes using this. It will give you an, uh, level, uh, give you an idea at what level you are supposed to teach this subject. I really learned a lot about how one should conduct one's academic life from his example. And I think his support was absolutely essential for me to navigate my early research career, which was not exactly smooth sailing. So again, I would like to pay my tribute on this teacher's day to Professor Rangwala. Last but not the least is the one person I would like to mention is Professor Mukunda, who was my senior colleague at IISC for decades. But I knew him much more before, much quite a bit much before I came to IISC. In fact, he showed a great uh, confidence in me by asking a very inexperienced me. I had not even taught for one year in my life till then, uh, entire one year. I had just finished a postdoc and he asked me to give lectures in a rather prestigious school, which he was organizing. And I can tell you the confidence he bestowed in me did wonders for my self-confidence and that was a particular time in my professional life where I needed to, I was somewhat short on that self-confidence. To me, he has been the teacher by example, by showing me what a scientist should be like. And I try in my life to follow him, but I, I'm sure I'm woefully short. 
you know, in the world of science, people can be your teachers, even if you don't directly interact with them much. And in the end, I would like to pay tribute to one such teacher of mine, Professor Steven Weinberg. He passed away on 26 July 2021. He was a Nobel laureate in physics and a consummate teacher. He wrote a large number of textbooks, actually seven, and many, many popular books. The most famous popular book that many people yet might know, and once upon a time, that was the book, if you wanted popular book, if you wanted to learn about cosmology, and that was the first three minutes, as well as the dreams of final theory. He was slated to give an undergraduate course in the fall at the age of 88, but he passed away in July, so which means he did continue teaching till the last minute. I, among many, many others, spent our lifetime working on physics of the standard model, which was put forward in the work for which he had received the Nobel Prize. I learned supersymmetry, a subject in which I wrote a textbook from his lecture notes, and decided to, to jump into the subject of supersymmetry phenomenology because of a paper he wrote in Physical Review Letters. Scientists like him, teachers, scientists like him, do not happen often. And teaching also has its rewards, you know. Students writing to you from lands of art and saying, can I please have those lecture notes on a particular topic? Now I have started teaching it and I found the way you had taught it to us was uh, very clear. I would like to follow it. Or you meet a student either in Netherlands, in China, in Germany and Japan. And they say some Indian student who is in uh, Germany suddenly tells me, oh, I listened to this lecture you gave in IIT Kanpur or set of lectures you gave in IIT Chennai. Or somebody says, or oh, lectures you gave in CERN school. Clearly, those are very rewarding. Those are very rewarding experiences as a teacher. But I think there is yet another very, very big report, reward. And that was enunciated by Steven Weinberg himself. As is natural for any academic, when I want to learn about something, I volunteer to teach a course on the subject. And I think this sums it all up that teaching rewards teachers as well. So happy Teacher's Day all around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, for, Madam, for your wonderful presentation. I think you have done a hard work to collect all your memories. And we join with you to salute all your teachers who influence you. I think most of the, our viewers are also influenced by and inspired by your teachers. Now, I will take this. Uh, thank you very much once again, Madam. Now, next speaker of the today's program, Dr. Nivedita Gupta, scientist, ICMR headquarters, Delhi. Doctor, I just want to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Nivedita Gupta, DBS from AD, Sporting Medical College, and PhD in Molecular Medicine from Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi, fellowship in Immunology. From All India Institute of Medical Science and postgraduate diploma in epidemiology from Public Health of India. She is also trained in vaccinology from London School of Hygiene and Medicine at the University of Geneva. She is working at Indian Council for Medical Research and is the in charge of virology units. She has more than 50 years of experience of working viral infections and has been instrumental in setting up the virus research diagnostic laboratory network of DHL ICMR established after 2009. In 2009, the VRD network of 124 laboratories is the backbone of the nation and has taken virus detection capacity to almost all parts of the country in SARS COVID-2. Dr. Gupta has been key person to augment COVID-19 testing capacity in India from a single laboratory in January 2020. Now there are 2,800 laboratories with a community of 50 plus COVID-19 tests conducted and daily testing capacity of more than 25. She is the key person to form a validation protocol for COVID-19 diagnosis yes. and conduct uh, uh, of multiple testing protocols like RT-PCR, treatment and CV-NAT for increasing outreach of the testing to district level. Dr. Gupta has also significantly contributed to the 
the public health surveillance. Dr. Gupta has also significantly contributed strengthening of the public health surveillance on diagnosis capacity of viral infections in India, especially related to arboviruses, dengue, chikungunya, Japanese uh, influenza, influenza, and rebella, etc. She has also been working towards sustaining the polio free status of India. She has also worked extensively for prevention of containment and research on Nipah virus disease in India. She has more than 100 peer review research publication and three book chapters to her credit. So this is a brief introduction to Dr. Nivedita Gupta. Now I request Dr. Nivedita Gupta to take over. Please, madam. So thank you very, very much, Mr. Bakshi. And I really thank all the organizers of this event on Teacher's Day. Happy uh, Teacher's Day to all the teachers who are here. And my lots and lots of love and blessings and best wishes to all the children who are here. And they are the future of our country. And I really uh, want them to excel in whatever field they take. And also my uh, sincere regards to the esteemed speakers, Dr. Godbole and uh, Dr. Shastri and all the esteemed members who are present here. So as, as was briefly told about me, I work at the Indian Council of Medical Research and I am the person who is in charge for strengthening the public health capacities for detection of viral infections in the country. So uh, when the pandemic, 2000, uh, this pandemic of SARS-CoV-2 stuck us, then I was entrusted with the task of strengthening the laboratory testing capacities for COVID-19 all across the country. Uh, initially, when the pandemic started, we had hardly 200 labs which were doing the RT-PCR test for detection of uh, respiratory viruses. But today we have more than 2,900 laboratories all across the country. So that task of uh, reaching or taking testing to all parts of the country was given to me and I try to do the best I can with all the team and all the support from my seniors and all the team members. So uh, I would just like to give an example of a teacher or I'll just uh, briefly mention about a teacher who has been with me since my childhood and has been my major source of inspiration and whatever I have been able to do in my life, I attribute most of it to him. So I don't have any slides right now, but I would just take you through a brief journey of my greatest teacher in my life and tell you various aspects where he's been able to influence me. So I know of a teacher like uh, who's uh, as a small boy, he was born in a family in a small village in Rajasthan near a place called Bharatpur, where he was born in a family which was actually kind of a bankrupt family where they would eat something in the morning and they would not know what they have to do in the evening. Even for their uh, daily survival, there was a challenge. There was something which happened in the family due to which the whole family went bankrupt. They lost their money. They had to sell their jewelry. They were living in a house with no electricity, no facilities, no awareness. So this little boy, uh, initially was quite misdirected in his life. 
but when he reached high school level studying in a village uh, school there was a lot of realization inside him and he decided to do something worthwhile in his life and that's where uh, this boy started his challenge and struggle in his life he did his bsc he did his basic science bsc and then msc from rajasthan university and he emerged to be the topper of rajasthan university in 1966 meanwhile uh, he didn't have much to eat he didn't have a good clothes to wear he didn't have any money to sustain his uh, education but he kept on struggling uh, taking several fellowships and sustaining his education somehow and that's how he was able to complete his msc he even tried to kill himself many times in between due to his personal struggles but somehow he survived uh, so once he completed his msc he moved to lucknow and uh, there is an institute a science institute which is known as the central drug research institute which comes under csir so this uh, he had become a man by that time and he did his phd from there he did his phd in organic chemistry uh, with a person called dr nithyanand who's a very famous uh, person in drug development and uh, he is a name so he did his phd from there and then uh, he sustained his whole family he settled his uh, brothers and he actually paid the debts of his family and then he moved to USA and USA he moved to MIT and he got an opportunity to work with professor Hargobind Khurana who's a Nobel prize winner and since then his life changed so he was there he worked with dr Hargobind Khurana he published 17 path breaking research papers with him and then though he was getting a professorship in Harvard uh, university at that time assistant professorship he decided to come back to his country and serve the nation so that's where uh, this person came back and he uh, again uh, joined the central drug research institute as a scientist and he started contributing his bit to science and that's how uh, he he was the person who published the first paper in science which is uh, one of the biggest journals scientific journals biggest and most reputed journals so he published the first science paper on malarial parasite and then he kept on working on different areas like drug targeting and moved to membrane and he became a full fledged membrane biologist by that time he published several path breaking papers and then eventually one day he became the director of central drug research institute in 1997 so the place where he had joined as a research fellow he eventually became the director of that place so uh, this person then did his bit he has contributed his best bit to science he got the shanti swarup bhatnagar award which is considered as a very very prestigious award in indian science in 1985 he got several young scientists award bhasin award ven baxi award several awards and uh, basically all of us know that when you are in a particular career it's always good to have a godfather or a supporting person or a big family backing also really helps you but this was a person who come like in and out moved throughout his life without any support without any godfathers but still he always emerged to be a winner and uh, what i learned from this person seeing him through and through in my life and let me break the mystery here this person is no other other than he is actually my father he is dr c m gupta and uh, he is is my father and i, I he is the actually the biggest teacher in my life so as a child i i have been watching him and what i learned from him is great amount of perseverance in life be very patient keep on persisting keep on struggling and you are able to achieve what you eventually want to achieve so here i just want to emphasize that what i learned from him is professionally it's it's def uh, definitely a lot of uh, uh, things and inspiration that i got from him but the most important thing is the best qualities in life which actually make you a winner so first of all i would just like to emphasize that it is very very important to have a very strong determination in life so to all the lovely children who are here 
I would like to tell you that always be determined in life. Never lose your confidence. If you think something has to be achieved, you can achieve it. Just have your determination in place and you, you actually are there. Then, of course, you second quality I would say is patience. So something, if you try something, if you fail once, please try again. If you fail again, please try again. So this is what eventually will take you uh, to, the, to the place where you want to be. And you can keep on changing your approaches every time you fail. Because if you are applying one approach and you are failing by that approach, please use another approach. Because one approach used once makes you a failure. If you keep on repeating the same thing again and again, it will not make you successful. So try changing your approach every time. And, and I, I, I can actually bet that you'll be there. Then the other most important thing is that please develop the quality of forgiveness. That's the most important quality in life. So, so please uh, try, uh, learn to forgive people in your life. Even if somebody you think has done something bad to you, forgive that person and just move ahead. Don't try to linger on to things. Don't try to linger on to past. Don't try to develop a feeling of animosity, jealousy. Just move on and it really helps. Don't, don't just uh, turn back. Then uh, the other most important thing is never lose in your life the desire to excel. Though you should not feel jealous about people, but you should always, always understand that excellence comes with a lot of hard work. You really have to slog. It never comes from for free. If you would have read what Milka Singh has been saying again and again, when you want to reach the top, you really have to slog. It, it, for, for anyone in life, for anyone in humanity, it never comes from uh, for free. You really have to struggle. Uh, uh, second, uh, the, the, another quality that I would like to point out here is honesty. So there are actually no shortcuts to success. Success really comes when you work hard, when you work with honesty. Anybody who thinks he can take a shortcut, he or she is wrong. So even if you do some shortcuts and you excel in your initial career, later on you are bound to fail. So please be very, very honest in your life. Be very honest with your career, your studies, and, and you'll be there. The other, other most important quality that I want to point out here is humility. Never, never let your success go to your head. Because it's very important to be humble and continue to be, be humble whatever you achieve in life. Because after all, you are a creation of God and you are bound to perish. So please never feel uh, proud about yourself. Never let down others. Just, just take care that you are just a human being and what you are achieving is by definitely by your own qualities, but definitely with the support and grace of God. So, so that is uh, most important to remember. And seeing these qualities which I'm talking out, uh, about here, this was one of the reasons that when the COVID-19 pandemic stuck in India, I, I really, I, I cannot explain how much pressurized we were in terms of we didn't have testing capacity in India. We did not have any testing kits in India because India doesn't make any testing kits. We used to import everything from outside the country. We didn't have trained people. But then actually we went on a mission mode project that yes, it's our country. We are all patriots. We are working for a common purpose for our own people. We have to do it. So that's, that's the quality which keeps you going. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. And that's how my father has been able to influence me. The reason I'm basically a medical graduate, I've done my MBBS from Lady Harding Medical College in Delhi. After I finished my MBBS, I really wanted to diversify from this profession because I did not want to follow the routine chain of doing an MD and then eventually having a small clinic or working in a hospital, managing a set of patients. I wanted to do something big. And that's how I diversified from a medical graduate into uh, science. And I did my PhD in molecular medicine. And then I actually got some experience of immunology from Ames Delhi. And then I moved on to ICMR to work in public health. And since last 16 years, I have been working on viral infections. 
and have been able to contribute my bit to strengthening the viral infection detection, diagnosis, and research capacity all across the country. And all this inspiration comes from my father particularly, though there have been notable teachers in my life, but since I thought I'd, I'll speak about the biggest teacher in my life, that's been my father. And secondly, uh, my mother who has told me to be very, very patient in life, fight through all the odds while also uh, being a good mom. I have two sons and uh, they are in class 10 and five. So I have to uh, keep, I have to nurture my sons also. So those capacities, those, those that, that strength of being a, a good mother, as well as a, a, bit, a good professional, that, that truly that inspiration comes from my parents. And uh, I would just, if, if you permit, I would just like to share a picture of my parents with all the children here. Can I get the sharing rights? Sharing. Uh, we already made your presenter. I think madam. there's something wrong at the. Yes, madam, you can share. So I think there's something wrong with my uh, laptop, and it's not permitting me to share. So, anyways, that's not an issue. I I would just like to end my talk here by just emphasizing on one thing that. You, there are a lot of teachers which guide you what you have to do in life, how, or what, what you would be most appropriate for. But the point that I would like to emphasize for all children is whatever you do in life, you can excel if you have the basic qualities which are meant for a successful individual and a good human being. So the qualities that I have highlighted to you here I think if you focus on getting those qualities inside you and be a very honest and good human being who always works very hard to achieve his goal, you all are bound to succeed. So I would stop here now and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Nivedita Madam, for such an inspirational talk. And as you rightly said, there's, there's no replacement of hard work and determination in life. And, and this, uh, the value of inculcating forgiveness in our life pales, pales way to at, attain much more. Otherwise we get stuck at a point. So thank you once again for sharing your views with us. And with this, uh, I'm here inviting Professor Paramjit Kurana, scientist, and from the Department of Plant Biotechnology, Genomics and Molecular Biology from Delhi University. I'll give a very brief bio about Professor Paramjit. Professor Paramjit Kurana has made pioneering contribution in the area of wheat and seri biotechnology and comparative genomics. During the past decade, genetic transformation of Indian wheat has been accomplished by her group for resistance against the serial cyst nematode and for abiotic stress tolerance. Mulberry transgenic, capable of withstanding salinity and drought stress conditions have also been developed. Her group is also developing effective genetic engineering strategies leading to stress tolerance in crop plants and sustaining agriculture under changing climatic conditions. In the past few years, research activities have been directed towards understanding the molecular basis of somatic embryogenesis and heat stress tolerance in wheat. In addition to an active participation in sequencing of chromosome 11 of rice and chromosome 5 of tomato as a part of international initiative, her group has sequenced the complete chloroplast genome of mulberry. She has authored more than 150 publications and presented equally in conferences and workshops. Professor Paramjit Kurana is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences India, the Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian National, Sci National Science Academy, and the National Academy of Agriculture Sciences India. With this brief introduction, I invite Professor Paramjit Kurana to inspire us all through sharing her journey of Thank her reminiscence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I should thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you people, to talk to others on such an important topic. 
and I must congratulate the organizers first of all for choosing such a topic. Uh, not that people are talking of the work, but they're talking of their experiences and who motivated them and how they were getting motivated. So keeping the broad uh, area of what role women have in science and technology, and today we are focusing on our mentors. And like uh, mentioned, yes, I come from the Delhi University Department. Uh, I studied at Delhi University and I joined as a faculty and just superannuated a, a few days back from Delhi University. But it's always a pleasure to talk of it because our work still continues. So when we talk of the word mentoring, I think most importantly, uh, we need to know who is what is mentoring. Mentoring is not only someone who tells you what your goals are, someone who guides you, someone who motivates you, but most importantly, someone who supports you all the way so that you can attain your success. Okay? And I think mentoring to have a good mentor actually is one who teaches you not to think according to your thought process, but you can think independently. That is the biggest one. And believe me, mentoring is always a two-way street. You, you learn a lot while mentoring others also. And this I've learned while uh, interacting with students at different levels as well. But today I'm going to be speaking about my mentors who have really made an influence on my life. And in here, I call these people as the four pillars of my strength and support. Uh, who are they? I will come to them in a while. First and foremost, I would say, is my father. Like Rohini, she was talking of her early childhood. I think my earliest inculcation of a scientific temperament was because of my father. Now, my father, like uh, even Nivedita, who was talking of her father, he was born in the pre-partition period and he did not have a degree or certificate. In fact, even his high school education was not. He learned everything. In fact, he was an engineer. I call him you're a non-degree engineer, okay? He learned it while he enlisted in the Indian Army before partition. And during the Army, where he was a part of the EME Corps, that is Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, he was an Army officer. And during his tenure, he invented a lot of little, little devices wherein things would help out. And later, he, after his retirement, good 50 years back, I would say, he turned one of his in invention, he patented that at the time, this was pre-70s, you know, when IPRs and other uh, things were not even heard of. People did not know what patent means. And one of his invention, he patented, and he was actually, I asked him once, you know, what intrigued you? He named his invention as the engineer's stethoscope. Very similar to the to the medical stethoscope, which the doctor checks and checks your pulse, your heartbeat, and knows what is wrong there. He says the engineers also need a stethoscope to when they are especially looking at bigger machines without opening them up by looking at the sound, by hearing the sound, you can know where the fault is. And in fact, he patented this invention. And he won the national award. He was also awarded by the Institute of Automotive Engineers uh, also. And even won several intercontinental gold medals. I call him an inventor come in innovator who also turned an entrepreneur later because he started manufacturing the whole thing, you know. The concept of IPR, social skills, self-reliance, small-scale industries and everything. I've seen my father do that in the 70s when these words were not the catchy words. And most importantly, I think he promoted gender equity. He said male or female, all children have the right to education and he always wanted us to study as much as we want. So my early childhood has was always, I was imprinted by technological and other advancements occurring at home and other places. These are some of the pictures I would like to share with the audience. Uh, which he won with the president of the India in 1969, the Industrial Development Internal Trade Affair Board, and the National Award by the Invention Promotions Board, 1970, by Vivi Givi at that particular. Of course, most importantly, I think he believed that nothing is impossible, and if you set your mind on something, you can get it, you can achieve. I think I, I, I simply adore him, not only because of his affection towards us, but I, I say hats off to him 
for being such a wonderful teacher because despite having no formal education, he was able to contribute something to the society and the highest awards by the automotive affairs and others he won, got, went on to win that particular. My second uh, mentor, I would say, would be my teacher, uh, Satish Maheshwari. He's a very well-known uh, name in plant sciences. Of course, he was also the fellow of all the uh, societies, all the science academies of the country, a Fulbright fellow, a Homi Baba fellow, a Jawaharlal Nehru fellow, and also the Shanti Sunu Bhatnagar awardee, which is very rarely given in plant sciences. In fact, in plant sciences, you have only one or two of them uh, so far, and you can count them. But his insight, you know, he's also a recipient of lots of other medals and prizes, which I've mentioned just a few. But the most important thing about him was, I think, his vision. He, he wanted that the plant sciences should not be restricted to just being a descriptive science, but rather it should be more involving. And he wanted the plant sciences also to advance with the changing time periods. He was basically a molecular biologist at heart. And looking at the advancements which were being made internationally in different fields, he wanted that India should also make state-of-the-art facilities. And that is why he was responsible for founding the first department of plant molecular biology in our country. And our department is famous for that. It is not specialized department of plant molecular biology. Of course, he was a teacher of par excellence. I've seen him spend weeks together to prepare a lecture. Uh, he would really work hard towards that. And I realized how much input a teacher puts in to have the class come up, to prepare for the class. He was fond of, he always liked challenges. He was wanting to learn of how flowering is initiated, how flowering is controlled in plants in a time period when we didn't have any knowledge of plants. He is actually more known for his discovery of haploidy in plants, which has tremendous agricultural implications and importance because all the plant breeding and other things when they want homozygous pure lines, this was a shortcut method to do that. He, he is more known for that, but I think his uh, basic thing was even when he discovered haploidy in plants, he was trying to understand cell cycle regulation. So he was addressing basic problems, which later turned out to have a practical orientation to. And till his end, I think he was always involved with photobiology, how light affects plant biology, how different types of light, red, blue light, far red light, UV light and others, they affect different phases of plant growth and development. I think that opened up a whole new arena in front of us. What people know of him is that he was a hard taskmaster. He was not an easy person to work with. He wanted your 24 seven, if you joined his lab for something, you were totally had to be committed to that. We had no holidays, nothing. All Saturday, Sunday, we used to be working in the lab, except two holidays we took when the DTC buses would not run. He inculcated in us the sense of self-discipline. I think that was the most important thing which I learned from. A scientific temperament, how to analyze things, how to view things, how to change your perspective, how to ask newer questions and how to address the basic questions. His commitment to science, till today I have not seen it in any place. And of course, the ability to strive for your aim, to be consistent, to be persistent, you know, like Nivedita said, if you fail once, doesn't matter. You have to keep on trying till you're able to attain what you set out to in the first place. So I think it is not only just your subject which a teacher teaches, but he inculcates in you many of these attributes which change your personality, which have a long-term bearing on your uh, methodology of working, on your approach, on your overall temperament as well. So my third uh, support, I would say, has been my husband, of course, whom I met in the same lab. He was also, he's been my biggest support and strength throughout all tough and um, other times. He's the one who's propped me up, who's made me stay where I am today. He, of course, was very talented, he is very talented. He's a Smithsonian Institute fellow. He was USDA recipient, also fellow fellowship, a visiting professor at Boxman. And of course, he was the president of the Indian Photobiology Society. And very much interested in how light, uh, tried to understand the molecular genetics of uh, light signaling in plants as well. 
and of course he's a fellow of all the national academies of our country the agricultural academy and also the cross that is the world academy of sciences GST. he's currently the vice president of of ENSA also and has served several other academies in various other capacities too. As a recipient of lots of prizes, but I still feel that he deserves much more than what he has been recognized for. Why? Because of his sincerity, his sincerity towards his subject, his determination to get something done and done efficiently, very of a good quality, his dedication to his subject. He loves his work. I think his work is his first love, I would say. And his perseverance under odd conditions, how he struggles, how he manages to do that. And of course, he's known in the entire university for his great sense of responsibility. Thorough gentlemen who people rely upon, who come to share with him lots of things here, basically because of his dedication to his subject and to his work also. He's known for his work uh, contributing to the chemical control of flowering in plants. And I realized how light, whatever I have learned today of light and signal transduction in plants is basically from him only. And how you control that, what is the genetic basis of this light regulation and how plants transduce signals, whether they're light signals or hormonal signals and how growth and development is actually affected. Here's the prime reason why we ventured into structural and functional genomics. Our group at Delhi University has been part of international efforts at sequencing the rice, tomato, wheat uh, genomes also, and now recently we completed the mulberry genomics also. That is the structural part of it. But more importantly, to understand the function of the genes which we have isolated, what role do they have in plant adaptation and others. I think for um, pushing me into this direction and others, and for teaching me how to explore this possibility. He himself continues to be a teacher um, of great excellence and the students, I know they brought up on him and his notes are extremely meticulous, very meticulous work, I would say. I've been very fortunate to be sharing my life, my academic as well as non-academic life with him. Um, lastly, I would like to mention a little bit of my fourth pillar of support, my mentor, whom I really call. Uh, that is uh, Madam Manju Sharma. Madam Manju Sharma is not a small name in the Indian academic circles. Of course, she's a fellow of the academy, but she was also the president of the uh, National Academy of Sciences and general president of Indian Science Congress. But she's more known for her role as secretary of the Department of Biotechnology. Biotechnology in the time when the world was waking up to this new technology. She was the one who established this department and saw to it that work got initiated at different places all over the country and scientists contributed to biotechnology in a big way. Uh, yes, she, she is known to give her impetus. She's known for a vision and also to spot talent, you know, that itself is a great talent. You know whom to support, how much to push and others. And once she was convinced of an idea, she would go all out go over all such uh, red tape is in another, she would not look and venture into that at all. But what had to be supported, had to be supported. I love her for this particular uh, farsightedness of hers. Of course, she has been honored even by the government of India, by the Padma Bhushan and others, and she continues till today, you know. She's 80 plus or so, to continue as a distinguished women scientist chair in NASI. And NASI has become synonymous with Dr. Manju Sharma. Why? Because, uh, not because of that she is a great personality, because she single-handedly spearheads the efforts of NASI. She has won so many awards, very difficult to label them, list them out in this year. Numerous lifetime achievement awards, big, big awards, you know, government awards, different state government awards. But it is basically her dedication to the cause of championing, taking science to the society, her determination to see that the National Academy of Sciences does well and a perseverance under all oddities, all uh, constraints to see that whatever has to be done is being done at NASI. I've been very fortunate uh, being the General Secretary of NASI. I've had to have close interaction with not only her, but with many others like Dr. Kapoor and others, and who was the president when we celebrated the Women's Day 
in 2018 at Vigyan Bhavan, and it was an international event organized by the National Academy. It was huge. But her vision, you know, whether she is championing the cause of women in science to see what should be done by the government, sending it to the policy makers, or whether we are talking of teachers training programs all over the country in different places, or we are talking of the tribal programs uh, for promotion of SESTs and others in the country. It is basically the, the logo of NASI, that is the National Academy, that science should be taken to the society, which she is spearheading in the true literal sense. So coming to the end, I would say uh, what I have seen is that a mentor is someone who sees more your talent, your talent and ability within you, which you yourself have not been able to see yourself. So that is the biggest thing which a mentor does. And believe me, there is a very delicate balance in mentoring someone. It is not that you want to create a replica of yourself, but you must give them the opportunity to create themselves to realize their true potential. And that is the biggest contribution of a mentor to a relationship. And yes, definitely mentoring matters, whom you have associated. It is up to you, whom you choose as your mentors. Your mentors could be your immediate family, your immediate friends, your teachers, people you come across. And you could have different mentors in different phases of life. They are the ones who really transform a person into a leader. And that is what makes it. And I think I um, very nicely aptly said by Nelson Mandela also. Ultimately, what counts in life is not the fact that we have just lived our lives. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of what of the life we have led. I think that is the most important. And finally, my last word of advice would be: yes, I have seen one thing which has no replacement, and that is hard work. You have to work hard. Wherever you are, whatever your conditions, whatever your constraints, no one is to going to ask you what were the conditions at that time. What did you do? Your excuses will not, your whatever you say will serve as an excuse. That is not there. And even if you're not able to do great things, you know, I believe that you should be able to do small things, but do it in a great way. That is what is uh, needed by everyone in here. And in the end, I would thank all the women in science, you know, who have been the star raisers, trailers for us. Thanks to all of them for spearheading the presence of women in science. And thank you all for your attention as well. Thank you so much. Thanks again to the organizers for giving me this time. So, thank you very much, Madam, for such an inspirational talk, inspirational talk and uh, sharing your views in terms of uh, the people, the role models that have shaped you as a person you are today. So I hope that all of us will take a leaf out of your experiences. And with this, uh, we are not having much time. So I'll straight away invite Professor Prajwal Shastri, who is retired professor from Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore, to kindly come and share your, your experiences with your mentors. Welcome, madam. Yeah. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks so much uh, to the VITM uh, Museum uh, for having me again today. I always fondly remember my interactions uh, with young people in VITM, uh, especially those that were a combination of in person in the VITM auditorium and across the satellite link uh, to distant students in other parts of Karnataka. Uh, it's always a privilege to be able to talk to young people and their teachers uh, about astrophysics, uh, which is my main fascination. Uh, and special thanks to Jyoti Mehra for not only having me, uh, but also for reminding me of that wonderful story uh, of Abdul Salam uh, that is so moving, so evocative, and also speaks to so many different things uh, at the same time. So thank you, Jyoti, for that. Uh, so just to explain uh, to you what astrophysicists do, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes ma'am. OK. Uh, yes. So uh, we um, look at the night sky and see what's happening there and try 
to understand what we see using uh, the laws of physics. Uh, not just the night sky, we look at the sky, whether it's the day sky or the night sky. Um, uh, a lot of the stuff that I will show you is about the night sky, mostly. Uh, and so, as you know, uh, in the night sky, we have the moon, which is the brightest object, and uh, we uh, see planets uh, like this. And on a dark night, we uh, see many stars in the sky. We see these shining dots, and most of them are stars. Uh, some of them are planets, like I said before. Uh, but uh, some of them, uh, oh, the screen isn't moving. Yeah, so uh, on a really uh, dark night, or rather from a place which has a really dark night away from the cities and so on, like here in Ladakh, uh, you see many more stars, about 3,000 stars uh, with just the naked eye. And uh, we know today that most of these are uh, stars like our own, sun. And in the past, there have been many imaginings of what these objects uh, in the sky are. So for example, in the Dhanipola religion of Arunachal Pradesh, they uh, talk about the sun and the moon being eyes of the fountain god, Sedi, the feminine sun, and the masculine moon. Um, in the Baigachak imaginings of central India, they talk about a hunter who shoots a catapult at a pigeon's nest and the eggshells scatter to become stars. But those were imaginings and there are such exciting stories from all over the world. But today we know that these are all stars like our sun. All the dots that we see are not stars. Uh, so, for example, this is the Orion constellation, and one of the very bright objects that we see there is not a star, but it's a, what we call a nebula, and it's actually a nursery uh, of stars, where stars are born. Uh, and all of these stars that we see with our Milky Way are gravitationally bound into a spiral-like structure, which looks like a band across the sky, and that's why we call it the Milky Way. And again, imaginings from ancient Australia, uh, Im they imagined a constellation in the Milky Way uh, because of the dark patches in the Milky Way and associated with the uh, bird that they have, the MU uh, bird. Um, for some reason, my slides are moving very slowly. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, it turns out that among all these thousands of dots, like I said, some are planets, some are nebulae, most of them are stars, there is one which is very nondescript. Uh, it is, again, it looks like a star, but it is actually a galaxy like our own Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy. And this is a picture that a friend of mine who's an astrophotographer took from Ladakh. And if it were to be close to the moon in the sky, it would look much bigger than the moon. And of course, it is much, much bigger physically than the moon with billions of stars in it, just like our Milky Way. And it turns out that at the center of each of these galaxies, including our Milky Way, there is a very big black hole when I say big, I mean a black hole that weighs uh, millions of suns. And so that is very fascinating. But even more fascinating is that if you look at a tiny piece of sky, say a piece of sky that is the tenth of the size of the moon, uh, that just that tiny piece of sky would contain 10,000 galaxies, roughly speaking, that we can see with today's facilities. And each of these galaxies at its center would have a giant uh, black hole, like I said before, which is what we uh, think is happening now. And also, each of these galaxies has billions of stars, each of them perhaps with a planetary system. And so each of those planets potentially uh, could harbor life. So that is the kind of fascinating uh, universe we have. 
And just to give a glimpse of my own work, so uh, a re this is some recent work where I looked at a galaxy similar to our Milky Way, which is this one. It's called the Karaf Galaxy. And it actually uh, has a very distorted structure in the middle, uh, sort of a bottle shape. That's why it's called the Karaf. And we uh, uh, figured out that it's actually a merger of two different galaxies, each of which has such a giant black hole. So now this is a galaxy with two giant black holes. And we tried to see whether a radio telescope would find them. And sure enough, we detected them with a radio telescope and also with NASA's X-ray telescope. So the stuff around this giant black hole, the black hole itself we can't see, but the stuff around the giant black hole, we are able to see shining in visible light, in radio light, and in X-ray light. So uh, Jyoti asked me to reminisce about what uh, might have shaped my life. I don't have uh, this wonderful story of a single mentor like Abdul Salam did. Uh, but thinking back on what shaped my life, I have to say that there were a whole lot of people who, act as, who acted as mentors, uh, starting with my parents and my teachers, and also a whole lot of books, I would say, which shaped uh, what I am today. Uh, but, you know, often people ask me, oh, how did you get into science? And, you know, it's really amazing that you become a scientist and all that. Actually, at the time that I grew up, it was not that amazing. Uh, I was born the year after Sputnik was launched. Uh, that is uh, Sputnik that you see here. And Yuri Gagarin and Valentina Tereshkova, who were the first, some of the first people uh, to go out into space, were my childhood heroes. And space was, I mean, science was just thick in the air, and we talked about it all the time. And uh, that it just, it it was just very natural in a way that one was excited by science. Uh, because it was becoming clear that science was the best way we had to understand the physical world around us. And uh, my parents brought me this book called The Atom. It was a wonderful little book for children with very evocative um, pictures. And in it was a description of Rutherford's gold foil experiment. And you should go back and uh, look at uh, this, this, the description of the experiment. It was quite fascinating in 1911. And what Rutherford did was he cast, he shined radium on a piece of gold foil. And uh, the radium emits alpha particles, as you have probably learned. And he sat there in the dark with a photographic film trying to find out where the uh, alpha particles came after they had struck the gold foil. And he, to his utter surprise, found that some of these particles bounced back, which then gave rise to the completely new picture uh, of an atom, uh, which was that the mass and the charge were concentrated in the center of the atom and not uniformly distributed all over it. And that reading just absolutely floored me. I was about eight years old when I read this, uh, read about this experiment and read this book. And so books are extremely important. Uh, another book that was a big favorite of mine, which I read over and over again, was this book called Chandru, The Boy and the Tiger, which really took me uh, into the world of the Adivasis in central India and uh, how they led this wonderful life, you know, connected with the jungle, with a tiger cub uh, as a pet, and uh, how they uh, hunted in the jungle, in the river, swam, uh, observed uh, life around them. It was absolutely fascinating. My mother gave me uh, the biography of uh, Marie Curie, written by her daughter, Eve Curie, to read when I was about 11 years old. And that, again, just re-emphasized uh, how uh, science was the best way to explain the physical world around us. I can't say that that inspired me to do physics directly, but it did have a major 
impact. And another book, which I have to mention, because it's not a very well-known book, uh, it's actually a science fiction novel, which my father gave me to read. I was, again, about 11 at the time, and it's called Andromeda, written by somebody called Ivan Yefremov. And it describes, it is, of course, a space age tale, exploration of other planets and all of that, but it's also a very um, different sociology from what I saw around me, where uh, people had completely uh, accepted the idea that science uh, is the best way to explain the world around us. Uh, it was very open. Uh, 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 society with open relationships uh, between men and women, warm friendships and collaborations and all of the rest of that. So uh, books can do can and do play an extremely important role, I think. And we can't forget that in this day uh, of uh, uh, sort of digitized learning and all of those things. Uh, so this is the school I went to. It's a very regular school, a Canada medium school, St. Agnes in Mangaluru. And I have to say that I can't single out one single teacher. Every one of my teachers there, whether it was teaching um, PT, you know, games, NCC, uh, math, science, social science, Canada, uh, whatever it was, they all brought that sense of fulfillment to what they were doing and that was the example we all saw uh, there was a bit of discipline and all that in school of course if the teacher was not around uh, for a class uh, because she was ill or something we would all horse around and uh, make a lot of galata but in class the children didn't have to maintain uh, discipline they uh, the teachers just got our attention because they were just uh, talking about something so interesting they all had different styles of teaching but they were all um, uh, nurturing people each of them in their own way and uh, i also had i also learned uh, i also took piano lessons and i learned carnatic music and i have to say those teachers as well shaped uh, how I understood both the world around me, how I understood myself, and each of them had something to contribute. So uh, I would really say that uh, the way uh, ahead is, uh, is not to treat each of these things like dance and music and science and maths as subjects, but as ways of thinking. And each of them brings a different way of thinking to how we see, and each of them is important. And so therefore, uh, it is important not just um, for those who might then become scientists, but for everybody who might become dancers or football players or whatever, uh, to have a good understanding of science. And science is for everyone. Science is not difficult. Uh, not, I mean, every any anything you want to pursue in which you want to achieve fulfillment, you have to put in hard work. You have to be analytical. You have to be able to focus, uh, and you have to be able to do some amount of drill. Uh, this is regardless of what discipline you choose. So regardless of that discipline, uh, you have to do all these things. So there is no particular thing which is more difficult than the others. And anyone can achieve fulfillment regardless of what they choose to do. But the important thing is to choose something in which you get fulfillment, but also bring to it what you learn from all the other disciplines that you've come across. So if you're a dancer, you must bring to it, uh, it must give you fulfillment, but you must bring to it uh, what you learned from science, what you learned from your Canada class, uh, and what you learned in the field playing volleyball. Uh, so all of these things. Um, uh, so I uh, I just wanted to give a glimpse of uh, this. This was uh, I went to the Indian Institute of Technology to do a master's in physics there, and this is not the physics department, but this is how the building looked when you came out of the physics department. And I would say, I mean, there were the IIT. Uh, okay, I should mention this: that people ask me about uh, how how difficult was it to study science as a woman. And I have to say that it was in IIT that I um, 
uh, actually first encountered any kind of uh, gender difference while studying uh, science. Until then, uh, it was a very different situation because in my school, it was a girls' school. Uh, the only men teachers we had were for music and Canada and everything else, including math, science, social science, English history, uh, NCC, uh, physical, uh, you know, PT and games. All of these were taught by women. Uh, in college, also, it was very mixed, 50-50. Uh, so my head of botany and head of zoology were women. Uh, the only physics PhD uh, in the college uh, faculty was a woman. And the faculty were very mixed. They were both men and women. So um, I didn't really think of science as being done by one or the other. And I also didn't think of um, uh, uh, you know, experiment is different from theory and all of those things. It was all blended in and it was just a very uh, fun thing. All these kinds of hierarchies I encountered for the first time in an IIT. That bit wasn't very nice, but I had some outstanding teachers there. And I especially want to mention uh, Bar Viratkar and Prabhakar Kane, uh, who, uh, who sort of opened the door for me in the sense that until then I thought that whatever was there in physics, it was all very fascinating, but it had all been discovered. And it was only uh, in IIT that I realized that thanks to these people that I could do experiments and I could find something new. So there was a lot to be discovered and uh, that was uh, still possible. Um, so, um, Um, I seem to have gone into some funny mode, and so my slides are uh, okay. So this is the UT radio telescope operated by the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, where I joined to do a PhD. Uh, and uh, uh, this is another glimpse of it uh, taken uh, by a friend of mine uh, who uh, took this during uh, the eclipse uh, in December 2019. And I uh, just want to say that at some point, you know, you transit from being a learner to being a teacher. Uh, this is my PhD supervisor, Vijay, Vijay Kapahi, who played an extremely important role in showing how uh, to be rigorous uh, about what you're learning, but at the same time, playful. That was just fantastic, a fantastic experience for me. Um, unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. Uh, and so he's not in this photograph, uh, which shows Govind Swarup here. Uh, who is the founder, is regarded as a founder of radio astronomy. He passed away recently. He built the, uh, he, uh, built the UT radio telescope. He uh, nurtured, he founded and nurtured uh, one of the astrophysics groups in TFR, which uh, operated this radio telescope facility, uh, which was then uh, a more advanced version of which was then built in Maharashtra called the Giant Meter Wave. Uh, radio telescope. So this photograph shows him. Uh, Vijay isn't here because Vijay passed away many years ago. And here are my PhD students. Uh, and so these are all sort of his grand uh, uh, students. And here are uh, some of the uh, interns that I have mentored. Um, and they've gone on to do, most of them uh, have gone on to do PhDs in astrophysics all over the world. Uh, and that's, again, very fulfilling. So talking about fulfillment and talking about teachers, I think this is uh, what uh, these are two. Th there are two things I would like to share. First, learning happens when there is a personal connection. So in the current scenario where there is uh, some amount of online learning was forced upon us due to the pandemic and all that. But uh, what is also disturbing is in the new education policy, uh, it is foreseen that a lot of the learning by design and by uh, intent will happen online. I want to caution that learning really occurs when there is a personal connection. There is a place for digitized information. There is a place for MOOCs, but that cannot substitute for uh, real 
in-person discursive learning, that is the uh, engagement, debate, uh, all these things have to happen in person. Only then will we create people who are critical thinkers, because what that is what education uh, is supposed to do. It is supposed to transform the individual into a critical thinker so that they can change both their own lives and also uh, the lives around them uh, in order to make them uh, better. And the second thing uh, is for young people that when you choose your mentors and when you choose your teachers and when you choose your institutions where you want to study, uh, I would say this is what is really important. The idea that teachers are those that in good teachers, I would say, are those that inspire one to have a fulfilling life. And um, of course, at the same time, achieving some level of well-being, but well-being is not determined by how much salary you get. Uh, this is something that we know for thousands of years. Philosophers have worked on this and concluded this. So we need to not we it's important not to ignore that. And so do find teachers and mentors who inspire uh, you to aim for a fulfilling life. Uh, with that, uh, happy Teachers' Day, everyone, and I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for your wonderful uh, visuals and information on astronomy, that is constellation, galaxies, and some research work. And uh, there's one books. thing I want to say uh, that I have to leave uh, because this is really, really late. Uh, but I can spend one or two minutes taking any questions if somebody has. Otherwise, I have to leave. I cannot stay. I was supposed to leave at uh, 12 15, and it's really, really late for me. I request uh, any audience, any questions you can put in the chat box so that the speaker will attend the question. And I also apologize for rushing through. I, I, it was because there was no time and I had to leave, but uh, you can go to my YouTube channel and there's a podcast also recently, which a friend of mine did uh, with me, which talks about how books uh, have influence. It's called uh, Read, Rebel, Repeat. Uh, and there are other talks uh, on my YouTube channel about astronomy and so on. So you can refer to that. I hope there is no questions, madam, on the chat box. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, madam, for your wonderful visuals and informations. And you mentioned about science books as well as some of the teachers that inspired you. Uh, I take this opportunity uh, to introduce the madam also. Uh, Professor Prajbal Shastri, is a retired from Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. She's an astrophysicist for nearly 40 years. She got her PhD from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and held a postdoctoral research position in University of Texas, Austin University, California, at Berkeley and Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics before joining the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, where she was the faculty for long 23 years. In her research, she specializes in the empirical investigation of giant black holes that are found in centers of distance galaxies. She uses telescopes operating at radio, infrared, optical, ultraviolet, and X-rays and gamma rays frequencies to study these distance galaxies and their central black holes. She has been Fulbright Senior Fellow in Stanford University, Senior Associate at the International Center for Theoretical Science, CIFR, and Distinguished Visiting Fellow at Australian National University. She is extremely passionate about science outreach, believes that cultivation of science thinking is for everyone, and uses astrophysics as a vehicle to engage the audience for all ages with these questions. She is also deeply concerned about the inequity in the sciences. Thank you very much for your wonderful uh, talk, Madam, about uh, astronomy as well as your mentors who inspired you. Uh, since there is no questions in the chat box, now I request uh, Sri Manash Bakchi, a senior curator from VITM,
to convey the vote of thanks. Please, sir. The responsibility of offering the vote of thanks uh, uh, reside upon me, and uh, I profusely thank uh, all our experts and eminent scientists uh, who joined us today on this occasion of uh, Teachers' Day. I thank uh, Professor Rohini Godbole, Professor Nivedita Gupta, Professor Paramjit Kurana, and Professor Prajwal Sastri for accepting our request and uh, coming here for sharing the experience uh, with uh, teachers. Uh, I take this opportunity to also thank Dr. Anant Kumar, who is the Joint Director of Bihar Council for Science and Technology, who offered to partner us in this program and uh, helped us in getting this program over to their area as well. I thank our Director, Mrs. K. Sadhana, for uh, coming into this program and uh, giving uh, the welcome address. Uh, I also thank our Director General, uh, Mr. Eddie Choudhury, who had taken interest in this program and uh, who appreciated uh, this program of calling the teachers uh, for uh, sharing their reminiscence. And uh, uh, just to end up with and to sum up with today, uh, we had a long session over which we understood uh, how some of our eminent scientists got inspired by their teachers, by their guides. In our, in our national folk culture, it is normally said that we have unknown gurus, we have pedestrian gurus, and we have gurus innumerable everywhere. So that probably is a thing and the respect for the teachers in our culture is also reflected uh, in the uh, very well-known Sanskrit saying uh, so all acharyas and all teachers are respectable in this sense uh, but uh, uh, i would like to end up with uh, two more points uh, as a physics student myself, uh, I have grown up uh, with the stories like uh, how Rutherford inspired uh, Bohr to do his work. And he was so much inspiring that Bohr left his uh, uh, doctoral position in one institute and shifted to Rutherford's institute uh, uh, instead for pursuing other sort of works. And uh, this happened just because of one lecture that he attended in the Solvay conference of where Rutherford presented his ideas. Similarly, we have heard about Bourne, uh, who produced more Nobel laureate students uh, uh, even before he got uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, we know about Raman, how he built up a school around him, a school of students. Uh, we know about Saha, we know about Bohr himself, uh, how he also created uh, one school of physics which could give the ultimate Copenhagen school of thought. So all that speaks volumes about the teachers. All that presents uh, how it should be. And uh, here, if I'm allowed to take this opportunity to mention two other forms of teachers, uh, sometimes all teachers are not really the persons who, whom we physically meet. Sometimes the teachers can be uh, influencing us through their books. Sometimes they can influence us even over a period of time where we were not there. And two such te teachers uh, I remember here is Jacob Bronowski, who left a very interesting teaching for the students as well, who said that uh, and the students must come to the university with a ragamuffin barefoot irreverence uh, to the content of study because their duty is not to follow what is existing but to challenge it and then secondly just before signing off i remember professor richard feynman who not only said uh, that the best of the teachers uh, are those for whom uh, the teaching almost becomes redundant. They show the way and the students, they find out what to do. But I'll end up with this uh, message that to the students, uh, 
uh, while I thank uh, all our seniors to be present here, all the eminent scientists to be present here. I also thank all the participants uh, uh, for sparing this time and uh, joining this wonderful program, making it successful. But I'll sign off with this last statement. Uh, uh, once again, not statement, it's a theory that Feynman proposed, uh, who said that if you have to understand anything, just teach it to somebody. When you teach, you also understand how much do you have to learn further. And I think on a teacher's day, we can end up on this note left for our student participants as well. Thank you very much for joining this program and making it so successful. Thanks once again.